to the lobby group. AfriForum had first made an application under the Promotion of Access to Information Act in September 2022, which had ESCOM opposed. Uh, AfriForum's campaign officer, Louis Boshoff, says they are simply asking for ESCOM to be transparent. So we're not worried about the amount of coal available in the ground or even already mined, but whether there's proper management of that coal in such a way that at a fair price it is procured by ESCOM without any mismanagement or malspending or whatever, while still selling coal at fair prices to other countries. It's simply a case of a free forum asking for transparency so that we know that it is being exported at fair rates and imported as well. And finally, rescuers in the U.S. city of Baltimore are searching for up to 20 people in the water following the collapse of a major bridge that was hit by a ship. Divers are searching in the icy waters of the Patapsco River at the entrance to the port. Vehicles and people fell into the water. The BBC's Sanjay Dashgupta reports. The moment of the disaster was caught on dramatic video footage and social media. In the early hours of the morning in Baltimore, a ship collides, probably with one of the pylons of the three-kilometer-long Francis Scott Key Bridge that spans the Patapsco River. An explosion is heard. The vessel bursts into flames. Moments after the impact, the bridge begins to collapse into the river bit by bit. Almost the entire span is underwater in minutes. Recapping your top story, the ANC has accepted ruling of the High Court in Johannesburg, which dismissed the party's bid to have the MK party deregistered. For SAFM News, I am Luanda Maume. Headlines at 1.30. SAFM 104 to 107 nationwide. The Market Update, Monday to Thursday, 6 to 7 p.m. Want to stay ahead of the financial game? Join us tonight from 6 to 7 p.m. for an insightful journey through the day's market developments, financial updates, and investment news. Tune in for your daily dose of financial intelligence as we navigate the twists and turns of the financial landscape with expert insights. Only on the SAFM Market Update. SAFM Market Update with Jimmy Muyaha. Looking for nothing but victory to cement a decent top half position. Mudrick takes over. Mudrick's through. Mudrick round the goalkeeper. Oh, it's fantastic. But the Clarets need four points to step out of the uncomfortable zone. Come on, Jakob. Jakob Ron Larson scores. Burnley lead. Perfect penalty. Keeper went the right way. Too much on it. This is the Premier League. Witness the superb contest between Chelsea FC and Burnley FC on Saturday 30 March at 4pm, live on S3. Also available on SABC Plus and SABCSport.com. Hashtag we love it here. Brought to you by SABC Sport. For the love of the Did you know that government has set a minimum amount for employers to pay their employees and workers? In 2018, the National Minimum Wage Act 09 of 2018 was passed in South Africa. It makes it compulsory for all employers to pay employees and workers a minimum wage. In 2024, the national minimum wage for all workers, including domestics, farm and forestry workers, is 27 rands 58 cents per hour. The minimum wage for workers on the expanded public works program, EPWP, is 15 rands 16 cents. If your employer is not paying you the national minimum wage, please contact a labor inspector at a labor center near you. The Department of Employment and Labor, working for you. The Full Circle with Bridget Masinga, Monday to Friday, 1 to 3 p.m.
Tepotsula, the late great Tepotsula featuring Tandu Sumazwai on uh, this one. Uh, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> My uh, team just uh, raised an eyebrow and I'm like, no, I distinctly remember uh, that occasion, no? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, Tepotsula coming through featuring Tandis Wamazwai with uh, Ndilinde is uh, the name of the song. Uh, and that is how we uh, open up the show for you this afternoon. It's just gone quarter past one o'clock on uh, this uh, fine, cool Tuesday. Uh, the weather's serving up cool weather today. I think uh, much to the relief, uh, primarily of those of us who were inland and suffering. We were under the grips of a heat wave for the entirety of uh, February and March. So uh, it's lovely to get some uh, cooler days, whether or not it's an indication of uh, cooler days that are here uh, for the next couple of months. We'll take it by ear at this point. Uh, coming up on the show, it is uh, 30 years of democracy, of course. So a lot of our conversations are interrogating exactly where we stand as South Africans and reflecting back on some of the challenges as well as some of the gains that we've had over the last 30 years. And uh, some of those could even uh, perhaps um, come into play when we consider sentiments around things like voting and participating in democratic practices. 
and uh, we're going to be catching up with the uh, Institute for Justice and Reconciliation who uh, conduct what is uh, called the South African Reconciliation Barometer and find out what these latest results uh, tell us uh, about where we are as South Africans. Also coming up in this hour, stages, pages, screens and more. We're taking a look at Emily the Great Dane. We'll find out more uh, from a visual artist Patrick about that one. On the other side of two, uh, we uh, delve into health matters and all the things that you need to know about your vascular health as it correlates to intimacy. Uh, And I'll also tell you what's coming up uh, a bit more in detail on the other side of this first hour. Uh, Let's take a quick break here and then we'll come back and get into that first conversation. Yanga have a massive mission to dish out orders in Dar es Salaam against 2016 champions. However, Masandawana believe in their ability to succeed anywhere on African soil. This is the first leg quarterfinal encounter of the CAF Champions League. Witness Africa's beautiful game. Young Africans versus Mamelodi Sundowns on Saturday 30 March at 8pm. Live on SABC Sport on DTT Channel 4. Also available on SABC Plus and SABC Sport.com. Hashtag, we love it here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. Think bigger than just a banking partner. Think a team of specialized experts supporting you to make better financial decisions to enable your growth aspirations. Think a strategic partnership providing indispensable advice to help you make the right moves. Think bigger. Think NetBank Commercial Banking. For more information, visit netbank.co.za. See money differently. NetBank. We're a licensed FSP and registered credit provider. The Market Update, Monday to Thursday, 6 to 7 p.m. Want to stay ahead of the financial game? Join us tonight from 6 to 7 p.m. for an insightful journey through the day's market developments, financial updates, and investment news. Tune in for your daily dose of financial intelligence as we navigate the twists and turns of the financial landscape with expert insights. Only on the SAFM Market Update. SFM Market Update with Jimmy Muyaha. You're listening to Bridget Masinga on SAFM. It is uh, the full circle with myself, Bridget Massinger, on uh, SAFM leading the conversation today. By the way, we are streaming on all of our social media platforms, so you can catch uh, the visual edition of uh, the shows via Twitter or X, as it's now called, as well as uh, Facebook and Instagram. Uh, wherever you are, we are there too. Uh, Jan Hofmeyer joins me now as the head of policy and research uh, at the uh, Institute for justice and reconciliation and we're talking around what they call the South African Reconciliation Barometer Um, and this one is a nationally representative public opinion survey uh, currently in its 20th year from what I understand Uh, it is the longest uh, running public opinion survey of its kind Uh, how are you doing this afternoon Jan? Good afternoon, Bridget. Well, thank you and yourself. I'm fantastic. Thank you very much. All right. I mean, uh, in its 20th uh, iteration or 20th edition, um, walk us through the beginning stages and what was the motivation uh, towards, um, you know, instituting the South African Reconciliation Barometer? Yes, uh, gladly. So um, we we started doing the survey in 2003, and as you might recall, that is the time just after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission also finished its public hearings um, around um, its particular mandate. And as an institute, we felt that it would also be necessary going forward to ensure that some of those recommendations of the, the TRC is being kept by government, but it's also being implemented by civil society. But we also wanted to understand how reconciliation and broader social cohesion processes in South Africa progress over time, mm. because societies also change, and all those things that stimulate us in our behavior also change over time. We have seen, for example, over the past decade, the entry of social media and how that impacts 
also on how we talk and relate to, to each other. So we needed to understand sort of how the process evolves over time. And yes, we're proud to say that over the past 20 years, we've conducted numerous of these surveys also to try and track patterns that that emerge over time. Mm. And speaking about, you know, sort of the changes uh, in society over time, over the past 20 years of the survey, um, have there been significant changes and patterns that have emerged uh, in regards to particular themes? Yes, I, I think it's important to track those changes. It's equally also important to see what are the things that stay the same. But I think the, the, the one thing, you know, that, that has changed quite a lot around the discourse of reconciliation and social cohesion in South Africa is the acceptance that one, one cannot reconcile in the long term and we cannot become a more socially cohesive society when we still have these very high levels of inequality in our society, which really also reinforces our patterns of, of interaction and, and behavior. Mm-hmm. Because if, if, if you are bound by your economic circumstances to live in, in a specific area and also limited by an essentially sort of apartheid geography in many instances, then then there is going to be very little interaction and engagement between people that come from these historically defined uh, cultural groups in, in, in South Africa. Mm. Uh, and let's hone in a little bit also on on uh, the the issue. For instance, uh, I know that the sentiment of distrust in leadership um, has uh, been one that's been brought up in the survey, uh, with results that I guess are not surprising given the uh, sentiment on the ground. That's that's correct. So, so one thing that we've witnessed, and this has started particularly around two thousand and five, two thousand and six where we've seen a growing decline in public confidence in public institutions to actually execute their mandates or their respective mandates. And so we've seen um, trust in uh, local government being very low and staying very low, but also declines in trust in confidence in levels of provincial government and also sort of at at the national level, um, in in national level, and that uh, that kind of pervades sort of a broad spectrum of institutions. It relates to institutions like the parliament. It looks to it relates to um, chapter nine institutions like um, the human rights commission it, or the electoral commission. That's particularly relevant this year. But in recent years, and, and I think that is quite sort of disappointing, where we've also seen sort of a decline in trust in the judicial arms of, 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 of the state. Mm. Um, and and uh, on sort of juxtaposed to that, though, um, there's also been some significant achievements and progress uh, in the two decades of the survey. Um, and considering the past that we come from, some people, you know, have often said that it's it's unimaginable just what South Africa has managed to achieve. Yes, and that's, I think what what I've highlighted just now is is probably the the less positive findings, but some of the more positive findings that have come out um, this specifically relates to people's idea of belonging in in South Africa. Mm. And we we see a very large percentages of, of South Africans who choose the identity of being South African above other sort of more limited sort of categories related to ethnicity or language, um, et cetera. Mm. And it doesn't mean that, they, that they're also not also proud of those uh, specific identities, but they can hold those two together. And, and I think, you know, that, that is really, really important. Also, in, in terms of questions that we ask people around, questions of reconciliation, social cohesion, do they believe 
we should be a united nation? Do they believe we will be stronger as a united nation? And their majorities of, of, of South Africans respond sort of positively. Mm. And it does not necessarily always mean that, that we that we live up to that particular ideal, mm. but, but it is quite significant that people believe that is what we should be striving towards. And if you if you look around you in the rest of the world, you know you look at the you know the world war in Ukraine in the Middle East, where questions of nationhood and statehood stand central to to these conflicts, and we don't have those. Um, and and if you think of our history, where we come from, I think that's a remarkable achievement that we all believe that we should be in this country together, that we need each other to make it work as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, as uh, as we, we listen to you, uh, Jan, I, I think what jumps out to me about the sentiment of belonging uh, and people still choosing to be South African is that it provides it provides us with hope, right? It, it, it's a positive we can all hold on to that uh, no matter how bad it's gotten um, and no matter what we are up against, there's they still that sense of, we are South African first, and perhaps we, if we explore the conversation more, we might even have more in common than what we think we probably do. That That, that is correct. And I, I think that is also the very basis that we need to to work from, as I, as I have mentioned. There, in so many countries, that does not even exist. And for us to, to have that as a basis to work from, I think that that, that is critical. And one does see it around you. There are many instances that does not always necessarily get the publicity it, it deserves. But there are many places across the country where people are working together to deal with the challenges that, that they face. Mm. Let's take a quick break here. And, uh, of course, uh, we're going to get into the headline news. But our lines are open if uh, you are joining us in conversation today. 86 is the number that you can call. Or 61 is our WhatsApp line if you'd like to send through a WhatsApp voice note or, of course, uh, a message. You are more than welcome to do so. We're also live streaming on our social media platforms. So if you'd like to get a glimpse uh, of our guests or perhaps uh, some of the energy in studio, uh, wherever you are, we are at SAFM Radio is our handle across all social media. Good afternoon, Bridget. In your headlines, the Information Regulator of South Africa says it plans to finalize the Electoral Commission investigation before the 2024 national elections on May 29th. Earlier this month, the commission had an incident involving an unauthorized disclosure of political parties' candidates list on social media. The ANC has accepted the ruling of the High Court in Johannesburg, which dismissed the party's bid to have the MK party deregistered. It says the case it brought to the Electoral Court was not against the MK party, but the Electoral Commission. And the DA has welcomed the acting National Assembly Speaker Lichisa Tonyudi's decision to grant it a motion of no confidence in Speaker Nosivio Mapisangakula. The party says the motion must be considered urgently and a special sitting can be called. I'll have details on these and other stories at 2. Bridget Masinga on SAFM. It is the full circle with myself, Bridget Missing on SAFM, leading the conversation this afternoon. Uh, and of course, it's just gone half past one. In case you were wondering, we are in conversation with Jan Hofmeyer, who's uh, the head of policy and research for the uh, Institute for Justice and Reconciliation on the back of uh, the most recent South African Reconciliation Barometer, uh, which measures the uh, public opinion on the ground on a variety of uh, things. Uh, let's also talk about, uh, as part of the survey, Jan, uh, you noted that SA society has changed significantly over uh, the past 20 years, and primarily so the makeup of society. We now have more born freeze uh, than we've had in the previous surveys. That, that's correct. We've, we've got more born freeze. I think if one look at demographic patterns over, over time, We've we've seen sort of a more urbanised society. We've we've seen households becoming smaller. We've seen people communicating in very different ways than than they have communicated before. We've we've got a 
a digital realm that exists next to the physical realm. And these two are, are intersecting more and more as, as well. So the dynamics of, of interaction and also how we conceive of social cohesion is as that's tra- changed dramatically o- over time. And, um, yeah, and, and, and I think that that is... It allows for a lot of opportunity also in promoting um, cohesion, uh, giving people access. Mm. Um, at the same time, uh, it, it also comes with um, sort of a number of disadvantages if one do not um, manage sort of the sort of new technologies and things in a responsible way. Mm, absolutely. Uh, and, and obviously, uh, you know, at the center of driving sort of the, the uptake of technology and integration of uh, technology into our social spaces, I guess, would be the fact uh, that we, we are such a young, dynamic society right now. And I wonder, um, you know, because if we have more youth that don't have the institutional and historical knowledge of the apartheid era and and the struggles of those generations does this also impact how maybe they view some of the things that have been charted by the reconciliation barometer yes um i I, I think this is also something that is very relevant to the elections coming up this year and also how they evaluate the offerings that different political parties offer them because they they also we, we also hear a lot about the change that has occurred in the country over the past 30 years and it's not you know it, it's not necessarily only positive or or, or only negative and, and one needs to you know also communicate you know the the realities on the ground to people in the way that uh, that they also understand the broader context in 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 which they they happen so so yes i, I think it is necessary to 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 be able to 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 look back and compare i think equally important is also to to see sort of what future we we are being offered and as you as you say this is a future of of the majority of, of South Africans who have not um, experienced the political transition. Mm. Jan, you still there? Yes, I am. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, and then l- let me also find out uh, fr- from you. So uh, when you, you, you looked at power to the people, um, and, and I want to actually just read this, uh, the reconciliation barometer also measured the attitudes towards political participation beyond voting and party preference. And one of the subdomains is internal political efficacy, which is people's belief in their own ability to understand and take part in politics. Now, I found that interesting because we make the assumption through all of our conversations that everybody understands, you, you know, big concepts like democracy, like social cohesion, and that everybody understands um, the, the, you know, political participation and the political system. But what I'm reading here seems to suggest that perhaps we are forgetting that some people do not understand the political system and hence may choose to not partake in it because of that. Yes, I, I think that, that deals with, with the question of, of agency. Um, and I mean, it does beg a, a number of, of questions around the efficacy of, of our democracy and its institutions. I think we we also have heard in the past people saying that that certain sort of institutions are not accessible. So so even if they exist, when they exist, people do not know how to to, to access them, and that also makes them feel powerless. And, and and I think that may also have something to do with the, fa- the fact that people feel that they're not able, or many people feel that they're not able to change the circumstances around them. But I think if, if, if one has to go to the essence of, of, of what a de- good democracy should be, it, it should relate to, to the agency that people have to shape the lives, their own lives, and those of, of their families around them, but also to, to shape the political 
environment around the, 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 the nature of the decisions that, that are being made about them and that influence their lives. So that is something that we definitely see. Mm. It also, to some extent, also relates to this thing that, that one often hears, that, that, that young people are not interested in, in electoral politics. And I, and I think this is something, an experience that is real for very young people, very many young people. It does not mean that they're not always necessarily not politically active. Mm. You do see polit- political activity in, in social movements. You see young people protesting. It is just sometimes they don't feel that the avenues that public institutions provide them with does give them the agency to make the changes that they feel that they need in their lives. Mm. Uh, And I guess as a parting shot, a a very direct question that uh, you asked is, uh, uh, you know, how likely was it that people were going to vote in the next uh, elections? Yeah. So so what we've seen is, is quite sort of a surprising sort of number of people indicating that they would. If my recollection is correct, that is, correct, that is above um, two thirds of our respondents, which is a good response if you compare it with uh, previous election turnouts, the most previous or recent ones, at, at least. So that does bode well, and we do really hope that that occurs because, you know, what whatever we say sort of about voting, it still is the most tangible way in which we can affect the outcome of, 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 of our daily livelihoods through the election of people that we want to represent us. Yeah. Uh, Jan, we appreciate uh, the time with you uh, this afternoon and for walking us through the reconciliation barometer. Uh, that was uh, Jan Hofmeyer, Head of Policy and Research Institute for the uh, Justice for, for justice and Reconciliation. Rather, It's fast approaching uh, 22 uh, two o'clock and uh, one of uh, the, the most reassuring pieces of information that came out of this, as you heard Jan earlier saying, that people still very much identifying as South Africans, still very much choosing uh, to be South African despite it all and if we have to break it into uh, you know data numbers 83% of South Africans agree that people should see themselves as South Africans first before other groups that they belong to. We've often had uh, this conversation around national identity and uh, you know when we speak in context of Mandela's Rainbow Nation to say perhaps we should first try and identify for ourselves uh, what it is to be South African first, much like how the Americans take their Pledge of Allegiance, uh, that uh, maybe we should take some similar Pledge of Allegiance um, that, uh, you know, just reaffirms and reinforces on a daily basis that before we are our respective races, our respective cultures, which are all very important things, and before we are genders and the roles that we occupy in our families, we are first and foremost South African. Uh, It is the full circle with myself, Bridget Missinga. Let's take a quick break. We'll come right back. Yes to list. Plan to disallow their visitors any breathing moment. But Asek Mimosas remain extremely hungry for maximum points on the road. The North takes on the West. This is the first leg quarterfinal battle of the CAF Champions League. Witness Africa's beautiful game. Yes to Nis versus Asek Mimosas on Saturday 30 March at 11 p.m. Live on SABC Sport on DTT Channel 4. Also available on SABC Plus and SABC Sport.com. Hashtag We Love It Here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. In a world driven by innovation, where progress knows no bounds, it's those who dare to dream, to push boundaries, who power our future. Join over 15,000 tech champions, visionaries, and trailblazers at Africa's largest tech event, exploring innovations across technology as we leverage tech for a more sustainable, connected tomorrow. Join us at Africa Tech Festival in Cape Town from November 11 to 14. Register your interest at africatechfestival.com. There are new and exciting moves for the SABC2 Familia. From the 4th of March, the life-changing game show Deal or No Deal with Katla Boy officially moved to SABC2 weekdays at 6.30 p.m. SABC2, it's where you belong. You're listening to Bridget Masinga on SAFM.
All righty, we are in conversation now with visual artist uh, Patrick Rolore, and uh, we're talking around uh, the uh, exhibition Emily the Great Dane, uh, and looking forward to uh, getting to know uh, Patrick a little bit better. How are you doing this afternoon, Patrick? I'm doing well, Paul. Thank you so much for for inviting me. How are you? I'm fantastic, thank you. Um, so, all right. I mean, you you began from what I understand. You began your artistic practice, uh, firstly by commissioned portraits. Um, but is art something that uh, you you know you knew straight out of school that this is what you wanted to do? Well, exactly. I did not know and. You know, art is just my talent, something that I've loved, you know, doing. And I didn't know that one day I would do it professionally, you know. So it is just by, you know, being encouraged and being motivated by, you know, family and friends that, you know, this is maybe my direction to take, you know, going forward. So, yeah, I didn't know at first. Aha. All right. And, and so for, for you, and interesting that, uh, you know, you you paint, as the title suggests, Emily, the Great Dane. Uh, you have a slight obsession with the hound. Uh, why <laughs> why the hound in particular? Uh, well, I'm a big fan of dogs. So, you know, growing up at home, you know, you know especially for my father, now he used to keep a lot of dogs in uh, in the family, and ever since, you know, like growing up, you know, it has always been our lifestyle to you know to keep dogs. And mm. sometimes it would get crazy where we would have about ten dogs, you know, in in the family. Sure. Maybe four four big dogs and six puppies, and sometimes seven. So and yeah, so the dogs that we currently have at home, uh, they are. Jack Russell's terriers, yeah, you know, and yeah, yeah, yeah four four dogs, you know, currently, and you know, sometimes we just give, you know, you know, our neighbors because the dog that we we'll, uh, will be having in the at home, you know, will be just you know giving birth, you know, out of control. So sometimes, you know, it's just out of proportion. So that is basically the you know the inspiration behind, you know, this body of work, uh, Emily the Great Dane. I have a very big you know, connection with dogs, and I was just so interested to paint her the mm. moment I was, you know, I had encounter with her here at Endabin. It's it's very interesting for me because uh, you know it's it's such a it's such a subjective um, sort of. I guess subject, uh, for for lack of a, a better phrasing, it's it's such a subjective mm-hmm. uh, sort of subject to be painting, um, and I wonder what has been the response to those who've encountered your work. Well, they love it, and like it's for for the first time. Well, you know, their dog is being painted that way, mm. so it was something amazing to really encounter and being part of the process. Because uh, usually, you know, what would happen here is when artists come and, you know, from all different kind of, uh, all different part of the world, uh, they just, you know, will continue to to work around, you know, their subject matter. So what I wanted to do differently this time was to just inspire, uh, you know, to be inspired by the place. And, you know, of course, it's just right in front of the lagoon mm. and the head of Naisna. And it's just, yeah, beautiful place, you know, beautiful people. And, you know, the moment I just saw, you know, Emily, you know, I thought like this is, this could be the best, you know, time just to, you know, paint a dog. <laughs> you know, as as yeah, as much as I'm, you know, a big fan, and this is a call for, you know, treating nature and animals as well. So yeah, yeah that is my intentions, you know, towards that. I mean, there's there's a very clear intricacy to your work because a lot of the imagery that I'm looking at uh, is very much uh, mm-hmm. sort of in uh, painted collage. Uh, lived experience type of form with with Emily inhibiting all kinds of spaces. Um, one yes. piece even featuring a, a, well an ode to Mum Esther Matlango on the walls of of one of your your pieces. Yes, yeah. Well, you know, uh, coming here at Neisner, um, 
and Dabini artist residency. You know, one thing I realized that this is like the epitome of, you know, luxury. Mm. You know, it, it speaks of, you know, wealth, you know, prestige. So I wanted to depict that on my painting because Emily, she's like a dog of the mountains. So every morning she's just blessed by these beautiful views of the lagoon, which, you know, most people, you know, are not blessed to see unless, you know, it's it's on vacation. So um, this uh, simple luxury has become Emily's, you know, everyday life or lifestyle, if I can put it that way. So having to put the Esther Mashangu's artworks uh, on the wall and also Karatsi Koto and William Kentridge was just to depict the, the standard of living that I have, you know, encountered here at, you know, on the mountains in Tabeni. She is definitely what they call a soft life living dog, I tell you. Her art collection <laughs> rivals yeah. the walls of many people. Uh, but uh, Patrick, it's been a blast uh, getting to know you and uh, obviously leafing through some of the works that you've created. Emily the Great Dane uh, is uh, an ode to uh, his love for all things canine. Uh, that was a visual artist Patrick uh, Rulori joining us in conversation today. By the way, named in 2019 as Cecil's New Signatures Awards for his artwork Stage for Moments. Uh, it is now time for us to get into Kids Corner, which will run us to the top of the hour. Leander standing by with your two o'clock news. Those who love the beautiful game can never have enough of the incredible moments. Like the fascinating last minute goals, the unbelievable saves, the top of the range reviews of critical match scenarios by the legendary Mr. Ray, the Mumich of the week, and highly knowledgeable analysts. Catch Soccer Zone on Mondays at 8 p.m., live on SABC Sport on DTT Channel 4 and SABC 1 at 10 p.m. Also available on SABC Plus and SABCSport.com. Hashtag We Love It Here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. For the love of the game. Fly better to your next holiday. Book your flights with Emirates to a holiday in Dubai, London, Istanbul, or Paris. Look forward to delicious regionally inspired cuisine. Enjoy free flowing premium drinks and relax to your favorite movies on the way. Because it's not just about the destination, it's how you get there. This year, fly Emirates, fly better. The Chill Zone with Bertha and Charuma. Now, with the gentleman that says, um, Women have now become, how can I put it, liars. I think that's just the way to put it. Have we lost it to that level, though? That goes to that. That goes back to the saying that says, "Known hells are preferable to strange heavens." Just because you don't know them, it doesn't mean they are better than the ones that you know. Uh, you just rely on your ignorance because they say ignorance is bliss. If what you don't know cannot hurt you, we don't have any guarantees that women who are outside of the country will act different. Because now generalizations will make us miss the individual that is different from the rest or that that does not conform to the norm. There are still people who don't conform to the norm. So it always helps to look at a person as an individual. The Shlokonolo Mazindo, relationship therapist and mental health practitioner. Bertha Charuma, Fridays 8 p.m. to 12 a.m. The Masked Singer South Africa is coming to a mall near you. Join in on the fun from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. at Maponya Mall from the 21st to the 24th of March. Uh, Centurion Mall from the 28th to the 31st of March. Blue Root Mall, Cape Town that is, from the 4th to the 7th of April. And you can meet The Masks, win awesome prizes and channel your inner megastar with season two of The Masked Singer South Africa only on S3. You are listening to The Full Circle. This program is brought to you by SABC Education. Enriching minds, enriching lives. Hello everyone. 
My name is Duretta Ngo, and I go to Macaulay House School. I am currently reading a book called Walk Two Moons. This year, I haven't had any reading sessions at home, but I do attend a book club at school. I'd rather spend my holidays reading books, but still doing a few activities, because reading is one way that I can increase my vocabulary, while I could still spend some of my time doing fun things with my family. I think that reading every day and during the holidays for us as children is very good because there are many new words that we could learn to increase our vocabulary which could help us in English exams. Hi everyone, my name is Zonaka Malihaz. I'm 10 years old. I live at Middleland Zone 7. My school is Tumbezo Primary. I'm here to talk about benefit of reading books than staying online during the school holidays. Yeah. Yes, there's a book that I'm reading at the moment. The name of the book that I'm reading is Oxford Successful English. Reading story books for everyone at home out loud makes me feel happy and comfortable. Yes, I prefer spending my school holidays reading story books because reading story books is fun and excitement. I think the benefit of reading books for me as a child experience especially during the school holidays, can help me understand better when the school reopens. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mene Angel Ngovera. No, there is no book that I'm reading at the moment, and the last book that I read, I don't really remember the name, but it was a historical book, so it fell under the history of South Africa and the colonism. So, how often I have my reading sessions at home? I don't really read a lot, like if I'm reading, it's either I'm bored, or I have nothing to do, so that's when I'll be reading my books. So I prefer spending my school holidays doing activities and not reading. If I'm reading during school holidays, I'll only read for like two days and then I'll stop. And it's all because I get too distracted and I forget about what I have to do. I think that the benefits of Reading books as a child during school holidays makes you know more things. You get to know some facts that you didn't know before and it, and it increases your knowledge. So let us learn the benefits of reading books and staying online during the school holidays. Thank you and have a lovely day. Good day everyone. My name is Amunga Zumiana. Well, I'm not reading a specific book right now, but I do read a lot of short stories every day. Yes, and I do engage in reading sessions and I do read out loud. Reading out loud can be beneficial activity for families as it promotes language development, listening skills and bonding among family members. During school holidays, some people may prefer engaging in activities to relax and unwind while others may enjoy spending time reading storybooks. Both options have their benefits depending on personal preference and interest. So you guys can do whatever you want this school holiday. Read or do fun activities. Thank you for listening. Hope you guys learned something new today. Bye. Greeting everyone. My name is Tian Ramatsuka. I'm in the 6 at Tumbezo Primary School. Today we are going to talk about benefits of reading. I have a book that is about Nelson Mandela. I read it before going to sleep and if there is no electric, I read it to my family. I prefer doing both activities and reading because it is a part of my school things because it helps us to read and know more things about what you are reading today i want to tell everyone that reading is more important than playing outside thank you hello beautiful people of mzansi my name is Lubanzi shongwane there is a book that i am currently reading and it is called freak the mighty to be totally honest with you, I don't read the book as much. Um, I read it a lot during like school, but now that it's holidays, I've told myself that I am not lifting a finger, I am not touching a book, I am resting. But while I was in the school process, I used to read the book almost every day and I would read it sometimes at school because it is a book that was... Um, provided by the school for us to read. I prefer doing activities during the school holidays rather than reading a book. I mean, reading is absolutely amazing and it opens 
you know, a different world and it really, really expands your vocabulary in a beautiful way. But honestly, the specific book that I'm reading is one that I read very, very often at school with my class. So when it comes to holidays, it's not something I want to do. I just want to have as much fun as possible, um, do activities and rest. Because I know that I'll come back to the book in two weeks time. So I mean, I'd rather do as much activities than read a book. I think it is definitely very important for you to read and not for you to have a specific time for you to read. Like, for example, you say you only read at school and you never come home and read, you know? I don't think that's really good. I think reading is something that you have to do and it shouldn't be something that's forced because if you read when you're forced to do it, you find that you don't really understand the story or you find that you actually really, really hate reading. So do it in a space where you feel like, I actually want to read. Because if you want to read, then that's when you'll start to understand the story. That's when you'll be encouraged to to read even more books that are of that specific genre that's when you start developing love for books and you start expanding your different genres of books you know so i feel like definitely have love and have passion for everything you do hi friends how's your holiday break going i hope you're having a great time have you taken a break from the digital world to make the most out of your time? By the way, are you currently reading any books? Choosing to read books instead of endlessly scrolling through social media is a wise decision. Spending too much time online can have negative effects, even if they're not immediate. On the other hand, reading books offers a wide range of benefits that go beyond just staying online. Firstly, diving into a book helps you concentrate and focus deeply. These qualities can often be challenged when you're busy with online chatting and social media because of constant distractions. Unlike the fragmented attention span that comes with online activities, reading requires sustained engagement with the material. This enhances cognitive abilities like comprehension, creative thinking, and analytical skills. Plus, reading stimulates your imagination, allowing you to visualize scenes, characters, and concepts. This nurtures your creativity and empathy, which are already within you. Secondly, reading books provide a sanctuary for your mental well-being. It offers a break from the fast-paced and often stressful online environment. Immersing yourself in a captivating narrative or informative text can be a form of relaxation, reducing any stresses you might be experiencing and promoting mental clarity. Studies have shown that reading before bedtime can improve sleep quality. It calms the mind and helps you transition into a restful state. Unlike screens which can disrupt your sleep patterns, reading physical books promotes healthier sleep habits, contributing to your overall well-being. Overall, the benefits of reading books instead of staying online are numerous. They not only enrich you intellectually, but also promote mental health and emotional resilience. So during these school holidays, why not give it a try and see how it positively impacts your life? This program was brought to you by SABC Education. Enriching minds, enriching lives. This is SAFM News. In our top stories at 2, the information regulator gives update on IEC probe and the NA approves penalties for MPs who fail to declare their interests. This is SAFM News. A very good afternoon. I am Luanda Maume.
We begin with some in, in election related news. The information regulator of South Africa says it plans to finalize the Electoral Commission investigation before the 2024 national elections on May 29th. Earlier this month, the commission had an incident involving an unauthorized disclosure of political parties' candidates' list on social media. The regulator's advocate, Sepa Buikanyo, had told the media in Johannesburg that the investigation was at an unv- advanced stage. We are at a very advanced stage with regard to putting together the report. Uh, We are just awaiting the information to come from the IEC. Our target is that in the next two weeks, we should... In the next two weeks, we should have a draft report. Uh, that would, of course, depend on uh, when we get the information from the from the IEC. But uh, we are very much at an advanced stage with regard to that. The ANC has accepted the ruling of the High Court in Johannesburg, which dismissed the party's bid to have the MK party deregistered. It says the case it brought to the Electoral Court was not against the MK party, but the Independent Electoral Commission. However, the ANC strongly objects to the use of umco to a user logo and name saying they are its heritage and intellectual property. It says it will address the issue in the High Court in Deben tomorrow. Elia Judge Lebuha Modibe says the Commission had the statutory obligation to give effect to the right to establish political parties. As the Electoral Commission explained, it has a statutory duty to promote the realization of these rights. Hence, its approach to applications for registration is to assist applicants to register and not to make it difficult for them to register. If a party who is grieved by a re- by the registration of a political party only raises a dispute after the decision to register a political party is made, it could have a prejudicial effect on the realization of the political rights of the party applying for registration, particularly in a case such as this one. The DA has welcomed the acting National Assembly Speaker Lichisa Tsenudi's decision to grant it a motion of no confidence in Speaker Nosivyoma Pisangakula. The party says the motion must be considered urgently and a special sitting be called. The DA's chief whip, Sivio Kwahube, says she writ- she's written to all the parties, including the ANC, to ask them to support the motion. The ANC chief whip, Pema Jodina, had, however, previously indicated that they would not support the motion as the Speaker had not been charged. The National Assembly has approved the recommendations of a report on the penalties to be instituted against 11 members who failed to declare their interest. The report of the Joint Committee on Ethics and Members' Interest recommended a number of penalties. They include the docking of salary payment for a period of 30 days. The acting speaker, Lichesa Tsenudi, reprimanded the members during a sitting of the House. The Code of Ethical Conduct Disclosure of Members' Interests provides a set of values for members. Among other requirements, the Code obligates members to annually declare their financial interests in a public register. This allows the public to confirm that no member may have been exposed to a conflict of interest. You, Honorable Members, have failed to disclose your financial interest for 2023 in due time. It is apparent from the committee report that you were provided fair opportunity to present your records. The affected members are Jerome Marke, Colin Malaji, Mandla Mandela, Pume Zampushe, Kolani Msimango, Kolangola, Nogzola Tolashe, Alfred Tseki, Judith Chabalala and Sbongile Zuma. And finally, the Chinese Football Association's former president has been sentenced to life in prison. Shen Shu Yan was found guilty of taking bribes of more than 11 million U.S. dollars or more than 200 million rand. An anti-corruption crackdown that President Xi Jinping leads has cut through the sport, banking and the military. The BBC's Laura Baker has rep- reports. Chen Shuyuan took advantage of his positions at the Chinese Football Association and other bodies to illegally accept large sums of money. The 67-year-old from Shanghai appeared in a televised documentary confessing to having accepted cash from those who wanted to get in his good books. The Chinese president, Xi Jinping, is a self-confessed fan of the game who hopes his country can one day host the World Cup. He ordered a sweeping crackdown on corruption that has struck hard at the game in the country. Recapping your top story, the information regulator of South Africa says it plans to finalize the IEC commission investigation before the 2024 national elections on May 29th. For SAFM News, I am Luanda Maume. Headlines at 2.30. 
SAFM 104 to 107 nationwide, leading the conversation. Those who love the beautiful game can never have enough of the incredible moments. Like the fascinating last-minute goals, the unbelievable saves, the the top-of-the-range reviews of critical match scenarios by the legendary Mr. Ref, the Mumish of the Week, and highly knowledgeable analysts. Catch Soccer Zone on Mondays at 8 p.m. Live on SABC Sport on DTT Channel 4 and SABC 1 at 10 p.m. Also available on SABC Plus and SABCSport.com. Hashtag, we love it here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. For the love of the game. The Full Circle with Bridget Masinga. Monday to Friday, 1 to 3 p.m.
It is uh, Metafix coming through with uh, Living in Dafu. That is uh, the name of uh, this particular song. I, I don't know. I'm going to put out the challenge live on air for my producers to say, if possible, in the near future, uh, sometime this year, perhaps uh, we uh, try and schedule some kind of conversation with Metafix. I don't know. I'm just I'm just throwing it out there as a challenge. They rise to the occasion when we challenge them, uh, you know, where you are bearing witness uh, to the challenge that I put forth. Uh, it is the full circle of myself, Bridget Masinga on SAFM, leading the conversation. Uh, it's just gone at 10 past two o'clock. And as promised, uh, we're going to be looking at matters of health and wellness. And we're going to be uh, chatting to uh, Dr. Vinesh Pariachi, uh, who is a uh, vascular surgeon right here in SA. And uh, we're looking at vascular health and uh, intimacy. Um, couples, especially those between the ages of 30 and 50, are unaware of the connection between uh, peripheral uh, artery disease and its impact on intimacy. And the good doctor has taken some time out of his schedule to uh, help us understand this a little bit better. Good afternoon to you, Dr. Vinesh. How are you doing? Hi, good afternoon, Bridget, and good afternoon to your listeners. Thank you so much for the time. Maybe let's uh, begin at the beginning and understand uh, exactly what we are talking about when we're talking about peripheral artery disease. So um, I think to start off with, um, just so your listeners understand, um, in your body, you have your heart, your heart pumps blood, and that blood has to get out the rest of the organs. And the way it gets out in the rest of the earth to organs is through little channels, we call them arteries. So it gets almost like plumbing. It gets it gets pumped out into these little uh, channels and they get traveled throughout, throughout the entire body, it supplies all the organs, and then it blood is then returned back to the heart through veins. So if we talk of, of peripheral arterial disease, we're talking about damage to the blood that to, to the blood vessels that carries this blood from the heart to the different organs. And that damage can either be in the form of blockages that develop in the blood vessels or where the blood vessels expand too much and start to dilate and call them aneurysms. So all of that entails peripheral arterial disease. Doc, let us just uh, try and find you on a different line. Uh, this one is sounding a little bit hollow for us, and we just want uh, to have as clear a conversation as we possibly can. So let's take a quick break as we try and shift the doctor's line, uh, and then we'll pick up from there. Buying a new TV? You'll need a paid-up TV license. Need to check your balance? No sweat at all. You just SMS your ID or TV license account number to 44210 for fast, effective balance inquiries. Secure your legal viewing fast and simple. Standard SMS rates will be charged. Terms and conditions apply. TV licenses. Pay yours. Make a difference. Looking for nothing but victory to cement a decent top half position. Mudrick takes over. Mudrick's through. Mudrick round the goalkeeper. Oh, it's fantastic. But the Clarets need full points to step out of the uncomfortable zone. Come on, Jakob. Jakob from Larson scores. Burnley Lee. Perfect penalty. Keeper went the right way. Too much on it. This is the Premier League. Witness the superb contest between Chelsea FC and Burnley FC on Saturday 30 March at 4pm, live on S3. Also available on SABC Plus and SABCSport.com. Hashtag, we love it here. Brought to you by SABC Sport. For the love of the game. Beyond the Headline on SAFM. Zimbabwe is currently battling drought and it's public knowledge that the country's economy is not doing well. Dr. Musarara is now joining us on the line. How bad is the situation? Situation is, as you rightly put it, we are negatively impacted by the El Nino induced drought. This has seriously damaged our crop this year and um, we had anticipated this um, 
uh, occurrence, and hence uh, we commenced importing uh, maize in October of last year from South Africa. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Dafadzwa Musarara, who is the president of the Grain Millers Association in Zimbabwe. Beyond the Headline with Aldrin Sampia, weekdays, 3 to 6 p.m. You're listening to Bridget Masinga on SAFM. We are in conversation with Dr. Vinesh Padiachi, who is a vascular surgeon, and uh, he's going to help us understand uh, a little bit more about uh, what we uh, talk about or, or, or what we need to know around uh, peripheral artery disease and how uh, that uh, affects other parts of our lives. Now that we have uh, uh, you know, a, a bit of an understanding, Doc, in as far as the blockages in the veins as well as the narrowed blood vessels that uh, reduce blood flow to the limbs. How prevalent is uh, is PAD and, and uh, it, does it affect a particular demographic more than others? Um, so that's, uh, that's a good question. I um, mean, you know, un- uh, unfortunately in sub-Saharan Africa, there's not too much of data available to us simply because there's so much variety in terms of rural, urban, um, that we don't have enough uh, studies and enough uh, uh, research being done on on this topic to give us accurate data. However, there was a recent recent publication uh, in 2023 which showed that the, the incidence is somewhere between 10 to 40 percent of patients would suffer from peripheral arterial disease. And it depends whether you live in a rural area or you live in an in a urban area where you expose more to, to westernized lifestyle and, you know, sort of a more unhealthy lifestyle. Mm. Um, and that sort of increases your risk factors. Now, previously, I think it, it this peripheral arterial disease was more of a of a Western problem. Mm-hmm. But as more and more of us are becoming more, and I'll use the term westernized, or mm-hmm. should I say modernized, maybe. Um, and we are we are eating more unhealthy, eating more fast foods, and our risks for diabetes and high blood pressure are increasing. We see more and more and more of of a rural population developing peripheral arterial disease. Mm. So it's not really confined to one particular population. Yes, some populations have high risk based on their risk for developing diabetes, but I think the incidence is starting to increase more and more and more um, in sub-Saharan Africa. Mm. So if I'm understanding you correctly, Dr. Vinesh, is that uh, some of the causes uh, to uh, peripheral artery disease are also lifestyle associated? Absolutely. You know, the big causes for peripheral arterial disease is your diabetes, your cholesterol, your high blood pressure, obviously age, and a bit of genetics play a role. Mm. Now, if you look at diabetes, high blood pressure, and cholesterol, I think diet and lifestyle are a key part of it. Mm. Um, you know, we are seeing a, a massive increase in, in diabetes over the last probably 20 years. And that, and that graph is increasing tremendously simply because of our poor eating habits that are happening now. You know, we're eating more fast foods, we're eating more takeaways, unhealthy foods, processed foods, uh, refined carbs. That's, that forms a major part of our diet. And that, that poor eating, that poor lifestyle, that lack of exercise, nobody has time to go to the gym, nobody has time to go out and, and exercise anymore. That all is impacting on us developing uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, mm. And that is what causes the, the, the peripheral arterial disease. Oh, and the, the other very important thing is smoking. Mm-hmm. Um, smoking is a massive risk factor for uh, for peripheral arterial disease. Sure. Uh, and I mean, all the things that you, you talk about here, you know, diabetes, cholesterol, age, high blood pressure, smoking. Um, yes, also associated with the older we become and also very much associated, unfortunately so, with the lifestyle that we see a lot of men, particularly men of color, uh, tend to tick a lot of these boxes. Absolutely. You know, it's, 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 it's become almost a way of life to go out, to, uh, to, eat, to eat at a restaurant, to have smoke, to mm. consume alcohol, to not exercise. And, you know, you say men, 
But mm. we're seeing an increase in women. There's so many women now going out now and they're starting to smoke. And I think the, the, the companies are now also targeting them. Yeah. And, and the, they, are, they are starting to increase their risks for diabetes, for, for high blood pressure, and, and, and the rest of all these these, these problems which, which cause uh, peripheral arterial disease. Yeah. Let, let's also talk about, um, you know, some early signs and perhaps some symptoms that would be an indicator that, uh, you know, one might be, uh, sort of entering this danger zone of getting peripheral arter- artery disease? So, you know, often it's very subtle. And, you know, most people won't even realize they have a problem um, until it's quite advanced. Mm. And in the early, very, very early stages of you having a problem, um, it, when it comes so it it can affect different parts of the body and when it affects the, the the legs for example one of the early signs is where you start to get cramping in the muscles when you're walking so you know you walk maybe 100 200 meters you find your muscles start to cramp up and also almost seize up and you can't walk anymore you have to stop and rest mm. and the, the muscles recover and then you can start again so that is a very very early sign that something may be happening there um, and as each organ is affected you'll have different symptoms that that are affected for example as the as the kidneys are affected you find find that you may be feeling a bit more tired, you find you may be uh, not passing enough urine, mm-hmm. and and you'll, when you go and you test, you find you've got a kidney problem. So as each organ is affected, uh, that you'll have symptoms from that particular from from that particular organ that uh, that uh, that, uh, that would show. Yeah, uh, and then you know I said in our in my introduction that as we talk about vascular health, we're also going to talk about its connection to to intimacy. What's the link there between uh, peripheral artery disease and intimacy? So, you know, as as the rest of the of the body, your 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 sexual organs are also supplied by blood. Yeah, and just as uh, arterial disease can affect the blood vessels in your leg, in your heart, in your brain. They also affect your sexual organs. Mm. And when the blood vessels, those organs are compromised and it start to, to narrow, so does the function of that organ start to, uh, start to, 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 to be compromised. So often you get patients who come and see you and they, you know, they, 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 they'll tell you, doc, you know what, I can't get an erection. Mm. And when you investigate them further, you find that, Yes, they've got a blockage to the the blood flow into the into the pelvic area, and and that causes a significant problem because often patients are embarrassed. You know, they they're too scared to say that they have a problem, and they just almost live with it for mm. the rest of their lives. Um, but you know, these are problems that we need to speak about. We need to face up to, so that we can avoid all these all of these uh, complications. Uh, and you, you know when you when you talk about uh, sort of patients being uh, embarrassed to talk about this, right? Uh, and and you can't diagnose something or treat something if if you're not uh, honest and comfortable enough to share even with your medical practitioner what you might be feeling or how it might be affecting you from a sexual perspective, whether or not you are able to get aroused or get a, an erection. Um, and these are conversations that we should be having. Absolutely. You know, uh, the doctor can only help you if you tell him what's wrong. You know, I think sometimes patients think that we may be miracle workers where we can just put your hand on you and say, okay, this is what's wrong with you. But the large part of what we diagnose comes from you telling us what's wrong. So mm. once you tell us what's wrong, we can then focus our uh, what we've learned to try and pick up what is causing your problem. So we work only hand in hand with what you tell us mm. um and i think that's that's very very important you know y- your relationship with your doctor should be should be free you should be able to go in and tell him everything without feeling embarrassed without feeling uncomfortable you know we we've we've heard and seen everything there's nothing that you can tell us that 
could surprise us or, or, or make us, us feel uncomfortable. So mm-hmm. I think that's very important, having an open, open relationship with your with your uh, medical provider. Yeah. Um, and you did say that, uh, you know, more women are now um, being susceptible to, to such uh, diseases. And I wonder, as we talk about peripheral artery disease and its connection to it, intimacy, um, is this also something that m- would affect women and, and in sort of which ways would it present for women sexually? Because uh, obviously, I don't know my anatomy and the blood flow of the vessels there as as to how it differs, for instance, uh, to a man's anatomy and the blood flow there. So I think when it comes to women, it's slightly different in that, um, you know, the, 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 the arterial problems may not be as big of a of an issue when when it comes to women intimacy however women can have a similar type of problems that affects their veins so they, they can have uh, something what we call pelvic congestion syndrome okay. where the veins in the pelvis start to engorge and they have pain when having intercourse excruciating pain to the point where they don't want to have it uh pain in the pelvis, which makes them feel heavy in the pelvis when they stand for a long time. Mm. Uh, those sort of uh, pathologies can affect women. Um, and, and that is something which we can address, which we can treat. But often patients are unaware that, you know, there is a, a, a solution to their problems and they just live with it um, um, unknowingly. Yeah. Uh, and in our final moments, when we talk about treatments and management, um, you, you know, where do we begin? What kind of treatments are available here as options uh, for those who, who might be experiencing this diagnosis? So I think, you know, before we come to treatment, I think the most important thing is prevention. Uh I think that's where we need to start. We need to start at the basics. We need to start taking care of ourselves. We need to stop trying to live a modern Western lifestyle. Um, We need to go back to basics, you know, go back to um, eating a healthy diet, eating cooked food, eating home food, eating, um, you know, not refined processed food, uh, your your white breads, your 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 starches, your defined starches. We need to start exercising. We need to avoid uh, chocolates. I know we're coming on to Easter now. I'm <laughs> sure everybody's going to be buying uh, Easter eggs and hot cross buns and all of those things. Those those things we need to cut back on. And if we can avoid, I think that's the start. If we can avoid the risk factors then we can avoid the condition. Mm-hmm. Once, if unfortunately you have developed it, then there are options. There are options for us to go in and, and unblock vessels, uh, unblock arteries, uh, whether it is putting in a stent, whether it's doing an angioplasty and blowing it up, um, uh, or doing a bypass and bypassing the blockages. There's lots of various options that we have to, 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 to address the problem. But for me, the key is prevention. prevention. That makes absolute sense to me. Dr. Vinesh Pariachi, we thank you so much for the time. And Dr. Vinesh Pariachi is a vascular surgeon here in the country, as you heard. Uh, the key is always prevention. Prevention is better than cure. Um, so uh, if you tick some of uh, those boxes, you know, you're at risk for diabetes, already diagnosed with diabetes, cholesterol, uh, you also fall within the upper end of the age demographic, uh, higher blood pressures, you smoke, lack of exercise exercise, your lifestyle basically is just not conducive to health, Um, then uh, there's a whole bunch of things that you need to be on the lookout for, including peripheral artery disease uh, and prevention is always better than cure. Half past two, Luanda Mawumi standing by with the headline news and then we come back with a special guest. Thank you, Pritchett. In your headlines, Higher Education Science and Innovation Minister Dr. Platin Zimande says the decision to cancel the registrations of the educo- edu- educational institutions is because they fail to meet several requirements set out by the government. Dumlin, City Varsity, Isai Isesa City Campus and Lyceum College are being shut down by government after failing to submit their financial statements for 2021-22 financial year. The Information Regulator of South Africa says it plans to finalize 
finalize the Electoral Commission investigation before the 2024 national elections on May 29th. Earlier this month, the commission had an incident involving unauthorized disclosure of political parties' candidates list on social media. And Venezuela's main opposition coalition has been blocked from registering a candidate to stand against President Nicolas Maduro in the July elections. The PUD candidate, Corina Yoris, said she, had an exhaust, she has exhausted all possibilities in her efforts to file her application. I'll have details on these and other stories at 3. Across South Africa, online and on radio. SAFM, let's talk.
special guest in studio. And you probably thought to yourself, well, it's not a public holiday. And she's playing a song at half past two. So what is going on? How are you doing this afternoon, Mr. Jeffrey Osborne? How are you? I am good. How are you today? I'm fantastic. All right. Listen, you, you have... <laughs> it's the first time I've seen my cameraman grooving. Oh. Like, <laughs> and, and he was... Normally, he just sits on the chair. You know, he makes sure I look good on the live stream. And and he's like, okay, I'm waiting for three o'clock until we're done. But he was gr- reminiscing. I, I, saw him over there. I saw him over there grooving. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, welcome. Thank you for popping uh, popping upstairs. I know you were just downstairs with uh, my friend David. Yeah. Uh, having a good old time there at Radio 2000. And then, uh, you know, you missioned up here to, to be with us for a few moments. Yeah. Uh, so glad to have you. It's great to be here. I, let me ask you this. So, uh, you know, I sent for one of my producers, Lebu, who who really got so excited when he heard you were coming upstairs. And he said to me, no matter what happens, you must make him do the woo-woo-woo song. Now I didn't have to make you do the woo-woo-woo song. <laughs> <laughs> like, do, do you get that request all the time? I do, to To, to perform time. this particular song? Yeah, that song is uh, very popular everywhere. Yeah. So, yeah, I get... Uh, quite a bit of request to do that yeah I, I've often <laughs> wondered you you know um how do artists feel about songs like this one uh you should be mine you know the songs that have become firm favorites where where, where audiences won't let you get off the stage until you perform it but for you you've performed it twenty thousand times yeah I have <laughs> but there's some songs you know you 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 get uh excited to do on stage just yeah. some songs that i look forward to doing and there are other songs that i just have to, you know i do but this is one of the songs i look forward to doing you know so it's always fun because uh, i always have fun with the people in the audience yeah. and you just never know what's going to happen <laughs> so, so i look forward to doing this song every show I, and I, I don't think there's been a show since this song was recorded that i haven't you know done yeah. this song yeah and i think it's it's also that interaction right people feeling like like they are part of your show and they are part right. of your moment with you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I give them that shot. You know, I always get in the audience and let people sing. So they look forward to it. I have people in the U.S. that come with the saxophones. Oh. They want they, they want to play. <laughs> <laughs> they brought their horn to the show. I'm like, what? <laughs> Like, they are a proper part of the band. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm here for it. I am here for it. They're like, if there was ever a spot and a gap. Uh, <laughs> let, let's also talk about, you know, I, I think this audience very much is familiar with uh, with your music. Um, but we also have a lot of, you know, younger people uh, who, who listen to, to talk radio. Um, and let's rewind back to the genesis, the beginning, right. the earlier days with LTD. Right. Yeah. How was that era for you? And being in the music at that time, you know, being young musicians, creating really what has become, you know, sort of the soundtrack to so many people's lives. Yeah. Oh, well, that was, that was, to me, that's my foundation. Uh, I think I learned as everything uh, being in with LTD because, you know, we had such a big group. There were four horn players. Sure. So I really got a chance to learn uh, and just develop as a songwriter yeah because i had all these instruments around me so i got a chance to learn how to orchestrate how to so that was really the the basis of my foundation being with ltd it was a great group great music uh had a lot of fun with LTD, and we had we did have some big hits back in the day. Absolutely, yeah. and, and then when one steps out from that comfort, I'm always personally curious uh, when 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 a, a musician steps out from an ensemble or a band and steps into fully into their own light. The motivation behind that kind of move, on the one hand, right. and also just uh, I guess initially the you know when you look to the left and you look to the right, and normally what would be your support <laughs> is gone. not there. Right, yeah. it's not there. Yeah, it's a different feeling going out on your own because, you know, you can't hide behind anybody else. It's just, uh, it's you now. But, yeah, uh, yeah I miss that kind of support. I mean, I felt that when uh, when uh, Love Ballad was recorded mm. and, uh, you know, the record company came to me and said, you got to get up from behind the drums because I was always playing drums and singing. Yeah. And so I had to get up from behind the drums because they said, well, all the ladies like this song. They want to see you. They can't see you with all these horn players <laughs> in front of you. So I would have... I, I had to learn how to conduct myself because I, I was used to doing my hands and singing. <laughs> and so I worked with a, the guy from a theater department, and uh-huh. he kind of opened me up to how to work an audience. But yeah. it's the same kind of thing. You know, you're 
had to feel comfortable out there and uh it worked it took a minute but yeah you know what I I also I, I appreciate what you just said because I think a lot of younger artists probably are not aware or don't appreciate the different components that come into play as mm. a performer. Right. You know, people talk about studio artists and being able to make great music in studio, but being able to perform is a completely different thing. Oh, it's totally different. You know, it's my favorite thing mm -hmm. uh, because in a studio, it's just you and an engineer. It's kind of cold. <laughs> But in front of people, you get that feedback, and it's that chemistry between you and the audience, and you give, and they give back, mm. and there's nothing like live performances. And, you know, I, I came up in, you know, back in the day, you know, <laughs> where they were in... In the U.S., there were nightclubs yeah. everywhere. So I got a chance to play when I was 13 years old. I started singing in nightclubs. So I got a chance to know how to work audiences. And today, they don't have that. They mm -hmm. have DJs everywhere. So they, a lot of the young people don't get that experience mm -hmm. at young to be in front of an audience. And uh, and that's that's crucial sometimes to know how to deal with an audience yeah absolutely yeah. Uh, we are in conversation with uh, the legend himself uh, jeffrey osborne joining me in studio we are live streaming on all of our social media platforms uh, at safm radio uh, is uh, the respective handle across uh, x uh, instagram uh, youtube uh, twitter wherever you are we are there too so if you want to catch the visual ahead of uh, the uh, concert that is taking place and we're going to get uh, to that concert in uh, just a matter of minutes and um, let's also talk about how music has changed in the years right and, yeah. and i wonder you've seen it go through oh, yeah. i've seen it <laughs> i've seen it anything. go through so many phases you know i mean even myself when i came up with ltd i'm, I'm the youngest of 12 in my family mm -hmm. so everybody played music my father was a great jazz trumpet player so i had to listen to all the artists before me i had to listen to the miles davis and sarah vaughn and billy eckstein and yeah. you know all the great jazz singers and so from that to r&b was a big change you know mm. and then of course doing r&b the flip to hip-hop and rap yeah is a big change musically and so music has changed a lot over the years uh i think it was way more musical back in the <laughs> sarah vaughn days and the sarah vaughn and uh you know the duke ellington music was just so you know it was just alive and it had so many components to it you'd have mm. a, a verse then you have a bridge then you have a chorus and today the songs are just written off of one motif <laughs> there's no bridge there's no chorus it's all written off so i think the character of music is changed a mm. lot i think there was more character in the music but i have to say i am impressed at the young people for what they've accomplished mm -hmm. in today's music because they did it the right way you know they came up they own all their own stuff and yeah. that's that's so impressive because back in the day that didn't happen record companies own your masters yeah. you, know, you know so i appreciate where music has come in that aspect i think it's taken a back seat musically a little bit mm. but i love what the young kids are doing they're, they're be becoming entrepreneurs and that's beautiful would you also say that maybe in some parts speaks to maybe the lived experience right you look at uh, you know yesteryear greats people lived life before re like releasing records and albums whereas these days music it's very fast people are chasing the next tiktok you know right, viral exactly. yeah. sort of trend whereas there was life and breath that it was experienced right. before exactly yeah it's totally different today and and these young people are on everybody else's project. Yeah. It's like, you know, you look up and there's, I'm on this one, I'm on that one, I'm on that one, which is really beautiful because it didn't happen like that back in the day. We, You didn't have all these singers coming together mm -hmm. like the rap artists are doing and people being, you know, guest artists on this album. But yeah, it did breathe back then. I mean, you, you know. You basically would do a deal with a record company. You do a three-album deal, so you do an al one album a year. Yeah. So you'd have that space in between before you did another project. Mm. So yeah, it's totally different now with the with the YouTube and the Apple Music and all that. I mean, you know, you can put something out just like that now today. But what I also love is, uh, you know, and I, and I see the the folks joining us in studio, uh, you know, who came up with uh, with, with you. It's a variety 
of, of generations. What I love is the discovery of old music, right? Yeah. We saw recently uh, at the, was it the Grammys uh, when Tracy Chapman performed oh, with, with, the, yeah, yeah. with the country yeah. dude. And and suddenly overnight, the download streams because the youth now discovered and right. people were like, who's this woman? You exactly. It, yeah. That's incredible. Uh, you know, it, it's beautiful. I, you know, I, I thank so many of the people my age for playing this music for their younger people. Yeah. Because I'm seeing younger people at my shows and I always talk to them and then well, my mom and dad played it for me, you know. <laughs> so so yeah, it's nice to see that they are discovering some of the old music because you know, it's it's where every everything comes from, you know the root which yeah. is back in the day and then music is only like eight notes and a chord so we've all played the same thing over and over <laughs> but yeah it's nice for these kids to go back and and check what's happened before them and appreciate what's happened before them and i think we owe a lot of that to radio mm. because radio has become so programmed over the years you know they don't play i know when i go to other countries they'll play a Beyonce, and the yeah. next song will be Frank Sinatra. Yeah, they don't do that in the U.S. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all programmed. It's like thirty song program list, and everything kind of sounds the same. Yes. So it's nice to go places where you're hearing music being played down through the generations. Now, let me ask you this. Your personal favorite era of music, uh, either because of the music of the time or because of the type of artistry that existed at that time or exists in that time? Right. Uh, I would have to say it would be the era in the, in the 50s. Mm hmm you know, when, when those singers that I mentioned, you know, I, I love Sarah Vaughan. She's like one of my favorite singers. And then you got Ella Fitzgerald yeah. and you got Billie Holiday. To me, they were the fourth instrument. It was usually bass, drums, and piano. Mm -hmm. And the singer expressed themselves like the fourth instrument. They were so lyrical in the way they sang. Yeah. Uh, today is a lot more confinement today. You got to stick to this, but everything was a little more fluid. To me, that was that's my favorite. It was just uh, more creative. It was just so much more creative to me. That makes perfect sense yeah. to me. Uh, and uh, bef before we, we, we uh, you know, begin to wind it down, Lebu, who I said is a huge fan, he produces uh, for Kathy Mushlana, who does the uh, 9 to 12 show. Uh, he wanted me to, to find out from you about the, the album Only Human, right? Right. Because uh, uh, he pulled up some YouTube videos for me, and he goes, this, this was the seminal album. This was the album. <laughs> and... <laughs> Are you in agreement? Oh, everybody is yeah, nodding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone's nodding. Uh, <laughs> that was different for me because I had been with George Duke producing most of my albums. And that one I switched to Barry Eastman, who was out of New York City. And uh, it was interesting also because I switched labels and I went to Clive Davis, who everybody kind of knows Clive yeah. Davis, which I didn't have a great relationship with. Uh, <laughs> but, Story for another day. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, you know that was that that was a that was a great project for me. Mm. It was. I don't know if it was my favorite project, but it was it was a great. It was different for me. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, the video was a good video that they did on Only Human. Yeah. Uh, we went to Hawaii to do that video, which was kind of interesting. Oh, uh, lovely. Yeah. Okay, so it was. You wouldn't necessarily say it is your favorite project, but it's a great project. It's a great project. So then yeah. I wonder which is your favorite project. I'd have to say my favorite project is probably my first solo album because it meant so much. You know, you, you're leaving a successful group and you're going into the unknown. I didn't know what was going to happen, whether mm -hmm. I was going to be accepted because my name was never out in front of LTD. It was yeah. just LTD. So people knew my voice, but they didn't know my name. Mm. So that first album means a lot because it kind of, you know, it it married my name with the voice mm -hmm. and which is the reason why we just called it jeffrey osborne because people would have to say this is on the wing of love by jeffrey osborne from the album jeffrey osborne so they had to keep so it associated the name with the voice and so that to me is the project that meant 
so much to me because I didn't know what was going to happen leaving the group. You know, a lot of yeah. artists leave groups and they're not successful. So, hmm. Very interesting. You've just given me something to think about there as I reflect on artists who've come out of groups and had solo albums. I'm trying to figure out how many of them have actually just gone with their own self-titled right. name as, as the album. Uh, so the concert is happening. Jeffrey Osborne is in town. You should be mine. Uh, the South African tour and of course tickets are available at uh, Ticket Pro for you guys. Sunbet Arena is where it's happening this Thursday. So 28th of March, uh, you can come through for that show. Uh, tickets are available via Ticket Pro. Uh, go through and have a great time. You should be mine. Is it just the one night or are we it's thinking? It's one night at the Sunbet. Okay. Yeah, but then we're at uh, the New Johannesburg at the uh, Empress Palace. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Then you head off to Empress yeah. Palace. Oh, lovely. The okay. Yeah. Lovely. Wonderful stuff. Uh, it's been such a pleasure getting to know you and thank you so much for uh, popping by. Thank uh, you for having much me. Much appreciated. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Right. It's just gone 10 parts. We're going to play out with a little bit of Jeffrey Osborne and then we come back on the other side and we wrap it up talking all things money. <laughs> <laughs> have a massive mission to dish out orders in Dar es Salaam against 2016 champions. However, Masandawana believe in their ability to succeed anywhere on African soil. This is the first leg quarterfinal encounter of the CAF Champions League. Witness Africa's beautiful game. Young Africans versus Mamelodi Sundowns on Saturday, 30 March at 8 p.m. Live on SABC Sport on DTT Channel 4. Also available on SABC Plus and SABCSport.com. Hashtag, we love it here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. In a world where voices are often silenced, democracy stands as a beacon of hope. For decades, we've upheld the values of freedom, equality, and justice. From the streets to the ballot box, every voice matters. As we honor the legacy of democracy, let's remember that it's not just a system, it's a promise of empowerment. Tribute to democracy, celebrating our shared legacy. Join us as we celebrate 30 years of our shared legacy of democracy on SABC. Together, we shape the future. SABC. Everywhere. For everyone. Always. ES Tunis plan to disallow their visitors any breathing moment, but Asek Mimosas remain extremely hungry for maximum points on the road. The North takes on the West. This is the first leg quarterfinal battle of the CAF Champions League. Witness Africa's beautiful game. ES Tunis versus Asek Mimosas on Saturday 30 March at 11 p.m. Live on SABC Sport on DTT Channel 4. Also available on SABC Plus and SABCSport.com. Hashtag We Love It Here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. Listening to Bridget Masinga on SAFM. 
Wrapping up uh, the uh, conversation uh, with uh, Dr. Frank Magwegwe, Head of Financial Wellness and uh, Advisory at Nedbank, Digify Africa in partnership with the leading financial institution, Nedbank has announced an exciting, groundbreaking financial literacy WhatsApp bot called Loazi. How are you doing this afternoon, Dr. Frank? I'm doing well. Good afternoon, Bridget, and good afternoon to FAFM listeners. <laughs> Indeed, we're excited at the opportunity, you know, to give South Africans 27 for 365, you know, an amazing opportunity to learn about managing their money better. Yeah. Uh, tell me, you, you've partnered with NetBank in creating this WhatsApp bot called Loisi. Uh, what was uh, sort of uh, the, the drive behind creating this bot? I think if you realize in three things, Bridget, the first one, we are going through a period where the economy is tough and the consumer has really been struggling for an extended period of time, given the interest rates and you know, general inflation being on the rise. And what we realize is often consumers don't quite have that foundational knowledge around budgeting, around saving, around how a credit card works, shopping around, you know, for value in terms of banking packages. So that is one of the reasons why we said it's an opportune time because we often find that that people often want to learn when there's a bit of a, bit of a you know, push factor. That's mm. the first thing. The second thing is really around the law level of financial literacy across the country. In fact, it's actually from our research at NetBank, it's a worldwide problem. So really saying we know you can offer financial education classroom style, you can offer it online and there's tons of it online. At the end of the day, successful financial education is about finding people where they are. Mm. So we realize that most people, even though we talk about you know, other online platforms in South Africa, without a doubt, WhatsApp is a leading um, uh, online platform. And so we went to where people are. And then the third reason, most financial education, it got perhaps a bit of a tone of, you know, you don't know, sit in a classroom, can I tell you what you don't know? Mm. Whereas our approach is gamified it. It's fun, it's easy to learn, it's bite-sized. You bored, you're in a shop, you're waiting to pay at the, at, the, at the cell. And then you can simply just say, let me quickly carry on with my learning. The system reminds you. So we've really made it funny. Made it yeah. Uh, let me also quickly just ask you, as I fast run out of time, um, one of the topics that's covered is thinking about money. What are some of the... But thinking about money are quite right. Money, personality, how do you interact with money? It talks about the idea of financial health, mm. you know, linking it to perhaps physical health. You know, the idea that savings, imagine savings, it talks about um, the difference between saving and investing, taking a little bit of risk, you know, to make our money grow. And then the final, of course, is that that's a big topic. It has to be around credit. Mm. What is credit? What is a credit score? What is a credit report? How do you find a credit report? How do you improve your credit score? What are the benefits of a good credit score as far as, you know, accessing good interest rates when you're buying a car, when you're buying a house is concerned? Those are some of the key topics that we have put there as medicine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dr. Frank, in our last uh, minute, uh, in terms of how do we add Loisy to our WhatsApp, uh, how do we integrate it onto our phones? Oh, we've got two amazing ways. One is just the number. We've got the Loisy number. You save it on your phone. That's one perhaps a little bit longer way of doing it. And you just type high and then, you know, you are onboarded. Mm. We even also have available online. We've got um, an easier way where you just scan a code and you immediately able to have it on your WhatsApp and you start learning about finances. Lovely stuff. Uh, Dr. Frank Magwegwe, thank you so much for this uh, very brief conversation, but uh, we but got all the important the stuff there. Uh, thank you. That was uh, Dr. Frank Magwegwe, Head of Financial Wellness and Advisory at NetBank. It is the 12th edition of uh, the Global Money Week, and of course, uh, they've partnered up with Digify Africa to launch Luazi, which is a WhatsApp bot to help you approach money differently. Um, and uh, as you heard, uh, you can uh, just uh, log on to NetBank, I'm sure, and then uh, you'll get 
get the QR code that you can scan and you're able to then integrate the uh, WhatsApp bot onto your phone. That is it from us. Thank you so much for joining us in conversation today. Uh, it's always an honor and a privilege. We appreciate you uh, choosing to uh, spend your hours with us. Uh, it's his final days, but uh, he gave way today uh, so that we could have Jeffrey Osborne in studio. But it is his final week with us, uh, and uh, he'll be popping in tomorrow as we officially begin the countdown for Mr. Aldrin Simpia. Uh, he's up three until six o'clock with his team from myself and mine. Uh, we are out of here, inshallah, God willing. I'm still on that. Woo, woo, woo. <laughs> and impartial. This is SAFM News. Thank you, Bridget. In your top stories, Zimande explains deregistration of educational colleges and the information regulator gives update on IEC programs.